Hello folks, my name is Dustin Jones, founder of the Senior Rehab Project. Very excited for you to hear today's episode. Uh, I was able to attend the CrossFit Level 1 seminar uh, recently, and at the end of that amazing weekend, I was able to sit down with a few very special people uh, to talk about the future of healthcare. So, the guest for today's interview, first is Dr. Julie Fouché, or Cuyo. Uh, many of you know her as Julie Fouché. She is a family medicine resident, uh, second year currently at the Cleveland Clinic, but she's most uh, well known as a CrossFit Games competitor. So she somehow managed to finish top five in the CrossFit Games while going through medical school, which uh, completely blows my mind uh, that she was able to do that. So very fit individual, uh, but very smart individual as well. She's also on the CrossFit Level 1 uh, seminar training staff, so she teaches uh, the L1 as well, and she taught uh, you know the course that, that I went to. Uh, she also is the host of the Pursuing Health podcast, very very popular podcast, a wide a range of guests um, from CrossFit Games athletes to uh, physicians doing pretty interesting research. Uh, but she's been a pretty uh, loud voice in in terms of promoting CrossFit for health, not just performance, uh, but just overall health. And we'll get into that in this interview. So that's Julie Fouché, her husband Danny Urcuyo is a family medicine uh, physician, so he's one year ahead of her, and he works with SteadyMD. So SteadyMD is, is kind of like a telehealth uh, company where you can uh, work with a physician that uh, really understands your interests and what you value. So let's say you are an avid runner. Uh, you can actually work with a primary care physician that is a runner, that is an accomplished runner and works with runners, uh, that you know understands what you're going through and isn't going to tell you just to stop running if you have X, Y, and Z condition, but they'll work with you you know, to get to the root problem. So he works with SteadyMD, focuses on functional fitness, uh, and is also very interested in functional medicine. He says he has two goals, bring functional medicine to primary care and help people live healthy and fulfilling lives. He's an avid CrossFitter as well. Awesome guy, and we recorded this episode in his office, uh, Black Flag Athletics, the gym where they both go to. Uh, third was my wife, Dr. Megan Jones. She's an emergency room physician. Uh, she's about a few years out of her residency training from Ohio State, um, and obviously I'm biased, but she's probably the coolest one in the room. Uh, and then second to her, I think, is, is our daughter, Lucy Lenore Jones. So our daughter, uh, we weren't able to get any child care, so she ended up in the interview. And you'll, you'll hear her several times throughout uh, the podcast. Now just to preface uh, the audio, the first 10 minutes uh, is okay, uh, but it's not great, but you can, you can get through it. Once you get past that 10 minute mark, you're good to go. Uh, you're gonna hear Lucy. Uh, she'll babble, she'll cry a little bit, but I've done my best to kind of edit that out or lower the, the volume so uh, we don't make your ears bleed. So uh, expect that, uh, but it's an awesome interview. We talked about uh, functional medicine, what it is, what it is not. We talked about the implications of CrossFit Health, uh, CrossFit's recent initiative to really pursue uh, you know, kind of the more broad public health uh, sector versus you know, really pinning themselves to be uh, working with kind of the elite performers, which is a stereotype that a lot of people have of CrossFit. Um, we also talked about just kind of how they perceive physical therapists and rehab professionals and how we can uh, better work together. So kind of a broad ranging conversation, um, but we really talked about the future of healthcare and what it's going to look like for physicians or for physical therapists. So I really enjoy it. So without further ado, Drs. Julie Fouché, Drs. Danny Urcuyo, Dr. Megan Jones, and Lucy Lenore. We're here. Black Flag Athletics. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm with Danny Urcuyo. Nailed That's it. Nice. Urcuyo. Are we? Yeah. We're at Black Flag <laughs> Athletics. I'm here with Danny Urcuyo, Julie Fouché, my lovely wife, Megan Jones. And we got Lucy Lenore over here, the <laughs> lovely five month old. Um, so, real quick, what do you do? What's your profession? I'm a family medicine doctor and have a special interest in functional medicine. Okay. And I am in residency for family medicine, and I also used to compete in CrossFit. Okay. And I'm an emergency uh, physician, um, been practicing a couple years uh, in Lexington, Kentucky. Lucy, she specializes in crapping her pants. And <laughs> <laughs> she just getting started. <laughs> just getting and started. Eating. Okay. <laughs> All right. So. You know, we want to have this conversation to uh, kind of bridge the gap between the interdisciplinary uh, or the team that we work with, but we hardly ever talk to. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> just so 
the PT crowd can get your all's perspective and also, you know, just have this as more of as a conversation. So if you all have any questions, I could, you know, be the PT in the room and, <laughs> and, and answer them. So more of a dialogue than anything. But I, w- I first want to ask, uh, why, why family medicine, why primary care? Because I remember when my wife was in medical school, you know, you have the rank list and what do I want to specialize? And you have all these things that you're weighing and, you know, you could mm-hmm. work, you know, four times a month and make $500,000 if you do this one specialty or blah, 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 blah. You know, there's all these benefits to certain specialties. Some have easier lifestyles, some have harder. <clears throat> and there's different stereotypes associated with them. But why family medicine for, for you all when you did that rank list? Mm-hmm. Do you want to start? I'll start because I decided first. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so even though he got there first. So I actually, when I started med school, I thought that family medicine was the one thing I did not want to do. I thought like I had tons of interest, but I thought I could rule that out because yeah. I thought it would be a little bit too broad. I didn't think it was going to be as interesting. And I thought I really wanted to become a specialist in one area of the body and know that really well and okay. kind of be an expert in that. But right before medical school and then in my first couple years of med school was when I started getting into CrossFit. And it was actually when I took my first level one seminar, just like we did this weekend, and I heard laid out for me the sickness, wellness, fitness continuum and the real purpose behind CrossFit and why we want to maximize our fitness um, and how that is so important in our health. And I realized that family medicine was the way to accomplish that. That's where you really get to develop longitudinal relationships with Mm. patients and you get to be the first ones that they go to oftentimes. Um, And you can really work on prevention of Mm -hmm. disease. And then once I got into my rotations, I realized I really did like working with patients more on that than I did seeing them in the hospital when they were really sick and it was almost too late. Mm. Um, And so that is kind of what brought me into family medicine. And then on top of that, I just like working, the idea of working with whole families. So I never, you know, I loved all my rotations. I loved working with kids. I loved working with elderly patients and everything in between. So it was just a really good fit for me. Okay, and you just copied her. Yeah, yeah pretty much. So yeah, I was like, that seems cool. Let's do that. <laughs> Even nope. though I followed him through all of the med school <laughs> <Yeah>. residency. <laughs> no, I, I decided on family medicine pretty late in the game, um, maybe a year out from applying. So I, I started medical oh, school. Less than that. Was it less? Yeah, it was, it was close to the end. Like January before <laughs> yeah. you started? Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, it, was, it was very, <laughs> maybe it was a little bit, yeah. <laughs> It was really down the wire. But I, I originally wanted to do transplant surgery, so I ended up doing a lot of research, got some funding to do a year-long project, and then everything was geared towards that. I would yeah. kind of stay up all night with the transplant team, go on procurements, and that was what I wanted to do. And then um, I really started to recognize that you know I wanted to prevent this, the stuff that these people were suffering mm-hmm. from. So that kind of was in the back of my mind, and then I kind of looked at ENT because there was a little okay. bit more... Um, longitudinal relationship to some degree. And then we went on this big trip um, with my family and Julie and Julie's sister. We went to Nicaragua mm-hmm. where my dad's from. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know, I don't know why I didn't recognize this earlier, but it's probably just because now I was in, in medical school where I saw a lot of folks suffering from the exact same diseases that people were suffering from yeah. here. Diabetes, high mm-hmm. blood pressure, not necessarily so much infectious disease as you would suspect, but more yeah. of these lifestyle related diseases. So then I thought, well, if I really want to make an impact. That's really what I need to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so then I started exploring internal medicine versus family medicine. And then finally, I did a, an acting internship, kind of like an audition yeah. in, uh, in family medicine. And I thought it was really fun. And I kind of just felt it was the right thing. And Julie had said, you know, wow, I've never seen you happier. <laughs> this, is, this is probably something you should consider. And then that's how I kind of decided. And that didn't happen until pretty late in the game in terms of yeah. medical school. Yeah. And you mentioned the lifestyle band. So obviously mm-hmm. different specialties have a different balance for your lifestyle. And for Danny, he realized that transplant surgery, that was going to be pretty much all he could do because it was just so consuming. Mm -hmm. Whereas family medicine allows us to have a much better balance in terms of doing things outside of medicine or being able to work on these other projects to try to Mm -hmm. help people in different ways. And integrate my passion for CrossFit too. Right. You know, that was trying to figure out how I was going to combine that with surgery that not very easy yeah. to do. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Why, why emergency medicine? Um, I think I was very similar. Like, I liked a lot of different things about my rotations in med school um, and had more 
difficult at the time deciding that I thought I would. I had really liked peds and I really liked some women's health stuff and I liked doing procedures, but not being in the OR all day. And um, I, I think finally, it must have been like very late third year, I did like a little elective in emergency medicine and found that it was kind of combining little bits of everything I liked. Like I got to see every age group, I got to do some procedures. Um, got to, um, I really also enjoyed that you kind of, you couldn't turn anyone away. Like you had to see everybody walk through the door and it's like, it was kind of a very, uh, almost like poetic thing that yeah. just kind of treating everybody on the margins and whether you had insurance or not or right. referrals or not. Um, and yeah, I just felt like it kind of combined all of that. And I was doing a lot of global health at the time. Or interest I had gone on some trips and was interested in that. I felt like it kind of gave a good basis of procedures yeah. and, and knowledge mm -hmm. base to go do that, that flexibility to leave and do those types of trips as well. Yeah. And I, I don't want to go into this topic at all, uh, <laughs> but I mean, as it turns out, you you may be functioning as a primary care physician, you know, just with mm -hmm. how the ER is utilized and, yeah. and whatnot. Right. So there's probably more similarities in some ways between what y'all oh, do. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And, and differences. So it's true. So we're we are at Black Flag Athletics. It is a gym, a health hub, a doctor's office, a. Mm -hmm. Uh, PT clinic, I think. Yeah, um, yep. But th so we had a CrossFit Level One uh, seminar this weekend. Mm -hmm. Julie helped teach. Uh, Danny was doing work, uh, looking at imaging and <laughs> talking to people and all that fun stuff. So one thing that has brought uh, me here has been the CrossFit Health Initiative. So you know, you all are in in primary care. Megan is to some extent, whether you like it or You're not. You're in primary yeah. care. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so for those that have not heard about this, how would you describe CrossFit Health? So if you could describe it, Julie, and then Danny, if you could just kind of give people a picture of, of what the potential impact that this could have mm -hmm. uh, in, in the healthcare system, but then just our society in general. Sure. Definitely. So, first. so CrossFit has always been about helping the average person become healthier. Yeah. Um, it's always been this program for the general public to try to do functional movements, to try to eat better, and support improvement in their health markers and their fitness markers. What it has become in the past 10 years or so with the growth of the CrossFit Games is that the focus has been a lot on the competitive aspect of CrossFit, mm -hmm. and often that's how people are first introduced to it, because yeah. they see something about the CrossFit Games and they think that's all it is. So... Starting about one year ago, Greg Glassman, who's the founder of CrossFit, created a division called CrossFit Health, where basically he really wanted to put the focus back on health and on the average person and helping to fight chronic disease. And um, this kind of came about because through the years, CrossFit has also become involved in a lot of different legal battles. Um, one from a research study that um, falsified some injury data mm -hmm. about participants that were doing CrossFit. Um, and then in the process of fighting some of these legal battles, CrossFit basically realized and Greg realized how corrupt a lot of our, um, a lot of our organizations are, our food and beverage or, um, industry, how much a lot of research is being influenced mm -hmm. by this industry. Um, there's a lot of conflicts of interest. And so they wanted to educate the general public about all these conflicts. They want to try to get, um, you know, the food and beverage, beverage industry out of mm -hmm. research. And so that's a big part of what CrossFit Health is working on. The other part that they initiated last year was to try to educate as many physicians as possible about what CrossFit is truly all about and to network those physicians in order to try to get the people who need CrossFit the most into CrossFit gyms so mm -hmm. that it's not intimidating um, so that people who have chronic diseases who can benefit from exercising and can benefit from improving their diet can have access to this. So last year, I believe they did about six um, CrossFit level mm -hmm. one seminars, exactly the same as we did this weekend, but they were held in California at CrossFit headquarters specifically for physicians. Um, and as a result of that, there have um, a lot of other conferences and discussions. So last year before the CrossFit Games, there was a health conference mm -hmm. where they CrossFit brought in speakers talking about a lot of these issues about 
um, some of the problems with our medical research and the way it's interpreted, um, talking about, I don't know who were some of the speakers. So they had Gary Taubes as one of the speakers Mm -hmm. who all spoke. Um, Axel Fluger, who is a brilliant nephrologist, internal medicine doctor, and he previously, in his previous career in Germany, was also a cardiothoracic surgeon, but he did a ton of research. Oh, I'm sorry. He did a ton of research that basically looked at, you know, he was a a nephrologist. He had this huge registry of data at Mayo Clinic, and he looked at the impact that the drugs and interventions were making on, were having on people with chronic kidney disease. And turns out the impact that those were having were so minuscule in comparison to exercise and nutrition, which you know, right? And he said, well, if this is how we can actually help these people, then why aren't we doing it? And yeah. how can we implement it? And that's how he got connected with CrossFit. So it's bringing a lot of smart people okay. together to try to rethink and reimagine the way we are delivering health and preventive care. Right. Um, I think that's pretty much. And so now then this year, January 1st, the CrossFit.com website has kind of changed its focus. Mm-hmm. And now if you go to that website, you'll see that it's really focusing a lot more on elderly population mm-hmm. and overweight population. Um, they're posting a lot of interesting research and articles about some of these problems with our healthcare system. Yeah. So for for viewers or listeners, if you want a good uh, illustration of what Julie just said, if you go, I haven't seen if it's on the new site, but if you go to CrossFit.com and mm-hmm. hit on the health tab, yeah. the mess, is it? Yeah. Yeah. So it's this amazing <laughs> illustration that you could stare at for probably six straight hours and not even grasp the the weight of it um so yeah it's it's a really interesting initiative uh big difference even before january one but january one was boom like Mm -hmm. new website new posting i mean it almost the first week almost looked similar to to our feed where we are doing squats and deadlifts and just some of these different things with with people that are homebound for example and and that was really cool to see so What's what impact do you see this having realistically? Not to get like too hyped up and yeah. unrealistic, but mm-hmm. th- what is this important? Is it going to be effective? Like, what's what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, th- I think certainly it's going to be effective. It's mm-hmm. going to be a, a big movement, really, not just something that stays isolated. I think to to hopefully just to CrossFit. But right now we're in this initial stage where um, we're just coming together. We're starting to recognize that, you know, you're not alone as a physician mm. that believes in this, in the CrossFit methodology and in the power of lifestyle factors in being able to modify a disease course more so than a lot of the medications that we have. Mm-hmm. And out of that, we'll see what comes. A lot of things are already happening on, on a small scale. Physicians are networking. They're potentially op- wanting to open up practices together mm-hmm. with the same idea of, of using lifestyle first approach. Um, I think what's going to be very exciting and where, where I see the next step being is being able to bridge this, this medical world with the fitness world mm-hmm. and having it be more of a continuum, not these two silos, the, the fitness field and then the medical field. Oh, yeah. And I think once that happens and we have a, a model and a community that's, that, where this is just commonplace and where um, CrossFitters just expect that, mm-hmm. I think you'll see this beyond the CrossFit community. People, everyone's looking for the same thing. They're mm-hmm. looking for physicians that understand lifestyle, that are looking, that understand the power of community, that understand the power of food. I think mm-hmm. we'll see more people come in into mm-hmm. this kind of community, really, mm-hmm. and we'll probably see CrossFit grow as a result of that, but I think we'll see this whole, this whole um, philosophy grow, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, what has me excited was that what Doug... Uh, Sacharis. Yeah. He was like the lead instructor for this weekend. His last words were to be inclusive. So Mm -hmm. he mentioned the shift from big CrossFit to, you know, with, you know, admitting initially we were attracting the high performance kind of hardcore people on the fringes. And now there's a strategic move to, to broaden that impact, Mm -hmm. uh, to grow it. And we need to be inclusive in, in those communities. So when you see that person walk in, that may be overweight or has never worked out before mm-hmm. or has X, Y, and Z chronic condition, uh, which you know, you, a lot of times you can't see that, but we need to be inclusive. And I freaking love that because yeah. every time you end a, a weekend like that, that, that note at the very final note is the thing that sticks into your head more than anything. And he right. chose that mm-hmm. very precious time to, to say that, right. which is that was very, very Why cool. is that? Yeah. I know. <laughs> but, but it's so true. And I think we're so well positioned to do it. I think that mm-hmm. it's going to take time because we have this shift to make. But 
Think about it. We have 15,000 affiliates around mm -hmm. the world that already know how to teach people how to move. Um, and even in those affiliates, there's already at least a few people in each affiliate who've come in very overweight or maybe mm -hmm. had some chronic diseases. But think about how much courage it takes for someone to walk in the door. I mean, even for just a regular person who maybe was an athlete like 10 years ago to walk in the door, it's really mm -hmm. scary and intimidating. So if we start to break down those barriers where people can, where we can get people in the door and we can get mm -hmm. people, help people get the confidence to want to make a change, then we're going to start seeing that as place in all those yeah. gyms and we're like set up to serve those people. Yeah. I was yeah. scared of that. We both were scared of that. Yeah. We were clean yeah. athletes and yeah. we consider so ourselves to be right? healthy at least. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So why why is CrossFit health intriguing to you? Like what about it? Um and you can give us some background too, because mm -hmm. I don't think I've told Julia or Danny just about yeah. kind of why we're here basically. <laughs> <laughs> you mean as far as like with like CrossFit and yeah, cro like, CrossFit yeah. Health and yeah. just, I mean, back in, what, October, November, when you're like, yeah. hey. Because I think we always kind of were, I felt like, CrossFit adjacent. Like, we mm -hmm. kind of always had a general understanding of what was going on and kind of followed it peripherally and mm -hmm. lived in Columbus, Ohio, like Rogue's big headquarters. Yeah, no so, <laughs> um, definitely kind of had heard about it, and um, but I was in residency at the time, um, and so it was like... <laughs> <laughs> I like Dustin was like packing my lunches and cooking me dinner, so it was hard to think about starting something new. And um, I think after having Lucy, um, wanting to get, I just missed. Um, I played college soccer and just had missed kind of working hard. Um, mm -hmm. We had, we run a lot, and I do enjoy running, but mm -hmm. just that working hard, and I'm terrible at like making myself work hard. Um, <laughs> so I was like, it's okay. much easier to do when you yeah. have people. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, and. Um, so I think I had, I'd come across a couple of documentaries on Netflix, more about the games than yeah. anything. And it kind of, I was like, hey, Dustin, I'm thinking of like revisiting this CrossFit idea. I'd really like to try it. And then that just kind of led into like the black hole of the internet and like yeah. <laughs> looking at all the things and kind of stumbling across you and a lot in your podcast, um, Pursuing Health and um, CrossFit Health and just mm -hmm. diving more into that. And then being in the emergency department, you see the after effects, right. um, kind of like with transplant surgery, like you're seeing sometimes the end of the road of a lot mm -hmm. of lifestyle choices and um, emergencies stemming from that or not emergencies, depending mm -hmm. on what brought them to the emergency <laughs> department that day. Um, but just seeing people like fired up about intervening in that and making a change um, kind of made me excited about medicine again. Cause mm -hmm. um, yeah, just the emergency department can be a hard place. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so uh, we kind of looked up our, local box mm -hmm. and tried stuff out and really have really enjoyed it and they have child care which is a big bonus yeah. and <laughs> um, makes it possible yeah so yeah, and so, so and you signed yeah so you signed up for i think october the, the, yeah the, the ndl one. one oh exciting. Um, oh, yeah so i was we kind of looked and i got on the they had released i think four dates at the mm -hmm. time for 2019 and got on the wait list for that and got an email i guess maybe three, yeah. two, three weeks ago that yes. um, they opened a new October one and luckily I got a spot cool. awesome. there. Yeah. So we're really pumped about that. So I think that. The, the PT crowd, who who all's watching here? <laughs> Alyssa, that we have a few people from the Game Changers group. So what what you just said is the same exact thing that's happening in my world as well. So, I mean, I'm home health, so I'm kind of like way on the, the end of the spectrum, but even the people in outpatient the, if we were to triage people's issues, you know, people may come to see us with low back pain, but their low back pain is not an issue comparatively to their diabetes or, you know, their risk at certain, you know, chronic diseases. And P PTs are starting to see that more, and but they don't know how to intervene mm -hmm. uh, and actually have a big impact. They know how to, to help with the back pain, but they know that they're, in terms of the trajectory of their quality of life, yeah. they may not have impacted it that much. So... The, that fitness forward or health facing, uh, whether it's CrossFit or not, I mean, just getting people to eat better and to move at higher intensities in, in functional and practical manners, that's like reviving careers for people. And a lot of them, like, you know, like me, are like, oh, what's this CrossFit stuff? And then, uh, and other, you know, modes of fitness as well. But it's cool to see that happen with you all mm -hmm. as well, because, yeah, there's so many burnout physicians that are just like, mm -hmm. even like the specialists, mm -hmm. like, man. 
this is actually, you know, the, the kidney doctor is actually saying, well, this is a, this is a nutrition problem, you know, but you can always, <laughs> right. But they don't do just that in that <clears throat> school. Yeah. Right. right? Yeah. So yeah. And it's crazy. Like I was just reading some stats the other day about over the course of, I don't know, the past several decades with drug prescribing going way up. And mm-hmm. now we have this, this kind of mentality of like, if you have a problem, you need a drug to treat it. And with our appointment times getting shorter mm-hmm. and more people coming through the ED, um, we're prescribing more drugs. Patients are less satisfied. And patients are yes. you, it's very unsatisfying. I mean, except for you know certain conditions where a drug is truly necessary and it's yeah. the only solution. Like it's very unsatisfying just to give people drugs and then for them to show up six months later. And overall, even though their you know their numbers are in the right spot, they're still mm-hmm. sicker than they were yeah. six months ago. Right. Yeah. That's a frustrating spot to be in. So let's, let's transition into that lifestyle prescription. Cause we're all operating in, in the health, the sick care system. So, you know, we may have limited time with people. Uh, we may not, I get to see them a lot. You all, you may, uh, you don't. <laughs> and Megan may, depending on the person. <laughs> Maybe all the time. Right. Right. Every Sometimes day. multiple times a week. Right. They're frequent flyers. So what, do you have any uh, words of wisdom when you have this conversation with your patients, uh, whether it's something that's been helpful or something that you've just bombed and failed and know, I won't do that again? Um, so I know, like, when I, I'll let you all think about your answer. Mm-hmm. We'll go through all three, three of you all. But, like, for me, for example, as a home health PT, this isn't necessarily lifestyle prescription related, but, uh, you know, when we're doing a falls risk assessment, Almost always there's an issue with furniture and rugs. Like I love your rug here. It's real pretty and it, it's a heavy rug so it stays lower to the ground. But like so many people have rugs that they'll trip on. And so, I mean, when I first start, got out of school, I would basically try and rearrange their living room and their bedroom <laughs> that had been the same way for like 40 years. Yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, and so, <laughs> right. So that whole like therapeutic alliance, so, yeah, I was just like some stupid 29-year-old PT just boss them around and they wouldn't do anything I said. So when it came time to say, hey, pick up this kettlebell and we're going to do squats, they're like, forget you, man. Yeah. I'll, I'll swing my TheraBand, my stretchy TheraBand around. Yeah. So yeah, so what, what words of wisdom would you have for... So, I, you know, we were very fortunate enough to to be taught a lot of motivational interviewing in residency. Okay. And Do you get any exposure prin- to that in PT? So now, but when I went to school uh, 10 years ago, wow, we <laughs> didn't. But now it, that and, and, yeah, so now you can get that, but it's not, it has to be in the curriculum, but it is, it is a very, very common th- thing that we'll talk about. Yeah, and for those of you that, that don't know, it, it's... It's a type of interviewing that is very participatory in in, in, um, in terms of involving the patient. Okay. So um, an example might be so if some, if we're talking about you know nutrition, someone's hemoglobin A one C, their average marker of blood sugar over the last three months is starting to creep up. Mm-hmm. Rather than saying you know you need to cut out the McDonald's, you need to cut out you know the sweets, yeah. and I'll see you in three months. We'll see if it's changed. Mm-hmm. You involve the patient. Say okay, what do you think about this number? What, what ideas do you have? And then you implement those ideas and you, inter- and you um, encourage them to implement the ideas that they came up with. Mm-hmm. And using that style of, of communication, that style of therapeutic communication, both in nutrition, exercise, mm-hmm. pretty much anything, getting them to take their medications. Right. You know? Marriage? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anything, really. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 Sometimes he tries to use that. <laughs> like, I know no. what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's so powerful. It's so powerful. And I think if you approach it like that, and in doing so, it, it intrinsically is done in a, um, even if it's not intentional, it's done in a caring way. Because mm. if you ask you know, somebody what they think, it's immediately developing a bond mm. with that person. So I think, to answer your question, it, it's really involving the patient in terms of coming up with ideas with, and how they perceive their mm-hmm. illness. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great first step. Okay, cool. Julie, what would you say? Yeah, I would just build on that, like finding out what it is that drives that person. Mm-hmm. And it's not something all the time that you're going to be able to figure out right away in your first interaction. So that's the like luxury that we have of getting to see people mm-hmm. over time. And what I'm learning that, you know, when I was in my first year, I was trying to get there really fast. But like, mm-hmm. you have a lot of time and you can see people over months and years and start to develop that relationship. But trying to figure out what drives them and what's going to motivate them to make a change. Um 
for example, like just saying, hey, you need to exercise because you, you know, have diabetes and that's going to help your diabetes. If they don't really care about their diabetes, then they're not going to exercise. But maybe they want to go on a big trip, like hiking with their friend in three years after they retire. Yeah. Then you use that as a motivation. So it's finding out what drives them. And then in motivational interviewing too, we talk a lot about that no one's going to make any behavior change. And this is true for me. It's true for mm-hmm. everyone. And I think about this a lot about why I do the things I do. But mm-hmm. you have to, one, believe that it's important for you to change. So if people are, um, maybe they just don't understand what their disease is mm-hmm. and what the possible consequences can be later on. And then they just need more education over time. Um, the second thing is they need to have the confidence that they're able to do yeah. it. So a lot of times that's a big hurdle because... You know, maybe they've never exercised in their life, mm-hmm. and it's so intimidating, like we talked about, even let alone walking into a CrossFit gym, like just going for a walk outside. So trying to help build their confidence and start slow and then build on that over time is way better than trying to ask too much of them too soon. Yeah. So making like really small goals and then building on that, I think, is the yeah. goal. So the ER doc over here, which is just like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is a terrible question for you. But I, I mean, what, yeah, what do you think about what things can you can you do to maybe even set someone else up down the road? Like, how how do you think about getting people to change their behaviors? Yeah, um, I think so. Yeah. Um, trying to, I think, establish. You know, I don't always have the luxury of. A return visit, yeah. and usually if it is a return visit, it's because we missed something or <laughs> they just didn't maybe listen that mm-hmm. there was nothing there the first time. But um, <laughs> they, I think, finding out like what was their motivation for coming in today? Like, was it, you know, sometimes it's well, I think this is going on, and I think everyone else has missed it, and like being able to just, you know, explain to them like why that might not be going on, or just. Mm-hmm. One, figuring out their motivation for, like, why they think it's an emergency. And then once you deem it's not, kind of seeing, like, trying to establish, like, how can I help you going forward? Kind of the same thing. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, what are your, you know, if your goal is to figure out why you've had this abdominal pain for six months, like, what resources can I help you figure out? Or, like, a lot of times you're the first person that's told them, like, your blood sugar's too high. Like, this isn't normal but they don't have a primary care doc or so in a way you're like almost like a hope stealer. Cause you're like, by the way, you might, you might have diabetes, um, uh, but f- kind of informing them of that. And then kind of talking about where can we go from here? Um, whether that's, you know, getting you in to find somebody or getting you in with someone that can yeah. help track these numbers and make interventions um, or like, Hey, that bronchitis. Yeah. You're telling me it's getting worse with your, every cigarette you smoke, mm-hmm. like maybe now's the time to mm-hmm. only do it four times today and mm-hmm. cut back a little bit. So it's definitely more difficult and um, just from that emergent acute care. Yeah. But I would point. say too, and I don't think we talked about it this weekend at the seminar, but some seminars we talk about it and Greg Glassman has always said like the first thing as a coach, like but above your coaching skills and your cueing and all that stuff, he says, like, the first three things you need to be a good coach are care, care, and care. Mm-hmm. Like, if you care about the person, if you're in an emergency room doctor and you care about them enough to talk to them about those things, you know, if you care about them enough to, like, act interested in their life and what motivates them, that is going to go a long way, I think, mm-hmm. for, like, developing that therapeutic relationship yeah. you talked about and then helping them be able to make changes. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. But I don't care. So. <laughs> Darn it. Ugh. Can't so, help you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's what, what um, it blows my mind. Yeah, just to see like some people in healthcare, you know, like we are we are servants, like we are serving people, but that's mm-hmm. not always a mentality. All right, so we talked about like the pre- prescription, which I think it's also probably helpful to to tell people that you know even. Julie Fouché over here is not getting people to join a CrossFit gym after the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, or even, you know, it, I think a lot of people think, oh, the CrossFit health, yeah. these, these doctors are all about CrossFit, they're going to get people in the box, like it's, it's not simple, obviously, like it's a very complex relationship and, and, and whatnot that takes time. So, so with that being said, you know, that we're, we're talking about the prescription of lifestyle changes or behaviors, there's also a shift in how we are doing that 
as well or how we're caring for people and you can't see it on the camera right now we have like a telehealth hub over here uh at Danny's office so what is telehealth and then why why are you doing telehealth yeah so you know in, in the broadest terms telehealth is using technology either telephone call video calls even text ah. messaging to communicate with patients outside of the office mm -hmm. and um it's being implemented pretty much um, in almost every discipline now mm -hmm. um, for many, many reasons. Access probably being, being the biggest one. Um, what I do for, for a living now is I work for an organization called SteadyMD. What they provide is uh, primary care virtually, mm -hmm. completely online. So obviously there's limitations to that. You can't do physical exam, but you have the beauty of being able to communicate with patients on a regular basis. So my, I have a smaller patient panel size, about 600 patients. So an hour with each patient, first initial minute. evaluation, right? Right, yeah, initial evaluation, then follow-ups, 30-minute follow-ups, okay. and then patients can communicate with me as much as needed, which sounds daunting mm -hmm. um, if you think about it from a physician perspective. But with a smaller patient panel size um, and frequent communication, you know, you actually have a very good relationship with mm -hmm. folks. And uh, it doesn't become overwhelming from the physician's okay. perspective. And although, like I said, you know, you know, you can't do a physical exam, I'm able to provide care. I think that's equal um, for a certain subset of patients, mm -hmm. but sometimes even better than in-person primary care. I think, honestly, even better. Hmm. Um, and it's, it's treating a certain subset of, of folks. So there's, I wasn't aware of this when, you know, I was in residency. You think that everyone comes to the doctor, right? Mm -hmm. And then they see you and then they come for their physical. I mean, it's a, it's a yeah. completely utopian view, but there's this whole section of society that never sees a doctor. So if I can provide them some sort of care, virtual, mm -hmm. and provide them with, you know, guidance, mm -hmm. then I think that's better than nothing. And I think it's improving the health of the population. Yeah. And, you know, that's what I'm doing, but telehealth in general is being implemented in many, many different ways. So some hospital systems, some practices have in-person visits, then they do their follow-ups virtually. It's very helpful okay. For, okay. for chronic disease management, things like mm. diabetes, um, high blood pressure, things of that nature. And then there's a whole other section that where consultative services are provided virtually. Mm. So let's say you live in a small town, you've got a primary care doc, you don't have a pediatric nephrologist mm -hmm. in the small town of you know, 5,000 right. people. So you can provide that kind of service. Okay. Many, many different ways to kind of implement telehealth. That's interesting. So, and I imagine it's probably being leveraged with, in your world too. Yeah, we've, I've mostly used it, um, like I work in a smaller, I rotate through a few different facilities, one being like a smaller uh, community hospital in rural Kentucky, and we'll do like telehealth with like psychiatric um, evaluations if we're trying to get somebody in, inpatient, like if they're in a crisis. Um, I've seen it used actually a little bit with stroke mm -hmm. medicine yep. as well, um, where you're just remote and you want, the neurologist kind of takes a look to say like, yes, no, let's use, you know, interventional medicines, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And expect this to, I mean, it already is in the PT world, but it, it's going to continue to yep. grow as well. So a couple things. So why better than a physical visit? Mm -hmm. Um, and then the second thing. What was it? Okay, we'll just do the first thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> In terms of better than a physical visit, it's not like that for every single. So a lot of folks that I see, um, kind of in the third between the thirties and fifties, maybe have mm -hmm. a um, a new diagnosis of, of a high blood pressure or insulin resistance, or on their way towards diabetes or prediabetes, and we have um, it's a situation where intensive lifestyle uh, modification mm -hmm. and motivational interviewing can really have a big impact. And where labs can play a big role in the treatment okay. plan and the diagnosis. Those are probably the folks that it's, it's most effective in. But then there's those folks who have really severe chronic diseases, too. Mm -hmm. Like people in heart failure. People with, you know, with, with uh, even end-stage COPD. If you mm -hmm. have the right technology. For example, um, there's now integrated pulse oximeters that uh, mm -hmm. link directly into my electronic medical mm -hmm. record. There's blood pressure cuffs that sync with my electronic medical record. Having people weigh themselves if, if they have heart failure, I can adjust their diuretics um, from home. Mm -hmm. All these things that you can do, and you can avoid hospitalizations that way, yeah. you can do with um, the guidance of an in-person doctor as well. So mm -hmm. communicate frequently with, a, with um, specialists. So let's say, again, this person in heart failure with their cardiologist or maybe even their in-person primary mm -hmm. care doc. There's a lot of, 
it's no surprise that there's a lot of like social situations um, that <laughs> inhibit people from coming to the doctor, right? right. So seeing an, their in-person primary care doctor might involve taking a days off, t- taking a day off of work, mm-hmm. and they're living paycheck to paycheck. It's right. just it's an impossibility. It's just it cannot happen. So that's where you know, telehealth can be really effective, yeah. and where I can come, can come in and help. Yeah. And it's been interesting, too, to see home health agencies adopt some of that technology as well. So I, I, not mine, but the agency that some of them that I've seen will have that same technology in terms of the pulse oximeter and, and weighing people and whatnot, and it, mm. communicating with the physician, which is yeah. cool. So yeah. I, I th- I'm really excited about that arena. I think it, we can serve a big group of people, mm. and especially an underserved group of people as right. well. So. So with all that being said, so we've talked about, you know, you all have been the traditional medical model. You're, you know, still in the grind, right? You're in, where are you? Second year of residency. So So middle, second, so you're like halfway. Halfway. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And so you've already made it through the hardest part. (laughs) The first year, yeah. Right. Um, So she's, she's almost out. We talked about CrossFit, CrossFit health and kind of the, the shift to be fitness forward and how that could create some ripples and, and especially in the medical community. Uh, the, the future of telehealth and how we can leverage some of this technology to, to influence people and interact with them. So if you, you don't have to close your eyes, but if you just close your eyes and envision this like really perfect model of what you want to see in terms of a, a health hub or a wellness hub, uh, what, what do you see? We may be sitting in it right now, but <laughs> Joy, what are you first and, and yeah. then... Dan. I mean, we can probably answer together because we talk about it all the time. But yeah. what we, I mean, what we really have realized through our experience with CrossFit is that the community is so powerful mm-hmm. and people's behaviors are so integrated to the people they spend time with, to the communities that they're involved with. And so we really feel like health should be rooted in the community and we kind of see this future primary care sort of fitness center to be the like a community center mm-hmm. of the future. And that would involve a cross similar like CrossFit affiliate where you have people that it's welcoming for people of all mm-hmm. different backgrounds and it's not intimidating. Where you have access to a physician when you need it who can guide you through whatever medical conditions you have. Um, where you have access to a dietitian, to a physical therapist. Um, to health coaches, people who can kind of be with you that you're going to see multiple times a week that can help you with those behavior mm-hmm. changes um, where everyone has this common goal in mind. And then together you're bringing more people into this community to help each other mm-hmm. be healthier. I think that's pretty Would much Would you add anything to that? Vision. No, you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we still need the ER doctors. We still need yeah. the Absolutely. surgeons. And that, yeah. That's, Absolutely. Yeah, there's a difference between... Like what? What medicine can really do? Like, or, or its proper role in its role right now? I mean, it, it, there's a big discrepancy. So, sure. so yeah, just where we are right now, Black Flag Athletics. You walk in through the door, boom, fitness first. That's what you see. You see people lifting heavy things, uh, having fun, high five and support all that stuff. You have to kind of come around to the back corner uh, and see the doctor if you need that type of care. Uh, very uh, lovely couches. And, <laughs> There's gravel on the perimeter, <laughs> and you're getting a water feature soon. Right? There's, people are asking for it, I guess. <laughs> We're going to have a water feature. Uh, and there's a PT clinic in here. Yeah, Connected as, PT. Connected PT. So, and then crying babies all over the place. So, <laughs> so, care for all ages. Right, inclusive. care for all ages. Yeah. So th- this is a model that, that's already happening. And I think what I think about um, is we don't have to wait. You know, we don't have to wait for some big change in payment structure or some colossal shift from up high. Like, we can be creative with the spaces that we that we yeah. have now, which is really mm-hmm. encouraging. Agree. If we wait for that, we'll wait forever. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Change has to come locally from right. each community. Mm-hmm. Love it. All right. Listener questions. They were about functional medicine. Mm-hmm. So, functional medicine, um, I'm going to let you all describe it. Mm-hmm. I see your all's name associated with that a lot. Um, mm-hmm. So how would, how would you define functional medicine? Yeah. Um, so functional medicine is, honestly, if I had to put it as plainly as possible, it's just good medicine. Mm-hmm. It's trying to get to the root cause of an ailment, of an issue, mm-hmm. of a symptom. Yeah. Okay. I think any doctor, doesn't have to be a functional medicine doctor with training in functional medicine, that's trying to get to the root cause mm-hmm. of the issue is practicing functional medicine. 
And um, it's become kind of synonymous with a term where you kind of integrate more lifestyle, counseling, therapies, mm -hmm. and using different modalities that are not necessarily conventional, but using the best um, kind of evidence-based modalities from different traditions, from different parts of the world, mm -hmm. and then using those to treat that individual, mm -hmm. always in the context of trying to get to the root cause. So functional medicine doctors or people who are trying to get to the root cause mm -hmm. use traditional labs, but they might also use some additional, um, more I would say probably cutting edge um, mm -hmm. labs, some of which have value, some of which maybe require a little bit more um, research to be 100% um, conclusive in being able to provide a diagnosis, mm -hmm. but still aid in the diagnostic process. So an example of that would be stool testing, for example, okay. looking at the gut microbiome. Um, that might give some additional um, insight into kind of total body inflammation, um, possible sources for, for some of their chronic conditions, mm -hmm. okay? And by addressing those kind of root causes, you can oftentimes get people better, I would argue sometimes even more so than conventional medicine. Mm -hmm. And functional medicine, in addition to kind of doing more testing and trying to get to the root cause in terms of um, kind of the underlying physiologic process, couples that with lifestyle. Okay. And there's a, ther I, you know, I'd be remiss to say, I'd be, you know, it'd be bad if I didn't say this, but there's a sense kind of a, a therapeutic order where you take, you know, the least potentially harmful therapies, um, lowest cost first, and you, mm -hmm. you try those and then you build on top of that. So mm -hmm. that would be, you know, sleep, exercise, nutrition, stress management, and I, can, I would add kind of community into that mm -hmm. piece as well. And using those to try to get people as optimized as possible. And if they, if they still have conditions or issues mm -hmm. or symptoms, then you'd maybe do a little bit more testing. Okay. Then maybe you do a little bit more advanced testing. And that's kind of the, the framework of, of functional medicine. Yeah, and if so we both kind of became interested in this and started learning about it when we were in med school and they opened a center for functional medicine at our, our medical school okay. at the Cleveland Clinic, and that was in 2014. And when we both went and heard this lecture by Dr. Mark Hyman, it was the first time we had heard functional medicine explained in kind of this is what it really mm -hmm. is, sort of similar to this is what CrossFit really is that we got yeah. this weekend. And it was finally something that made sense for us of a way to practice medicine. And one of the models that the Institute for Functional Medicine uses is a tree. So mm -hmm. basically you have at the top of the tree all the leaves, which are kind of the symptoms that a person may be having. And then down at the bottom you have the roots, which are what Danny just talks about. Those are your lifestyle factors. Those are like sleep and stress and nutrition and exercise and relationships. And often what we're doing in the conventional world is we're just working up in the leaves. So if mm. someone has a rash, we prescribe them with an anti-inflammatory cream. There's no real question about let's look deeper into those roots and figure out why does this person have the rash mm. and how can we get rid of that. Okay. Um, and so that was what really, I think, appealed to us. Yeah. So <clears throat> the questions, which uh, I don't know much about functional medicine, but it seems like, like CrossFit, there's lots of stereotypes probably inaccurate <laughs> in a lot of ways. We had two specific questions. So Jason Robinson and Amy uh, DePelto. Jason just took the L1. Oh, awesome. And he texted me this morning. He's like, when are we doing the L2? I was like, <laughs> hold your horses. <laughs> uh, he said, many functional med docs push supplements heavily from what he's seen. Uh -huh. uh, what are your attitudes on supplements? And how, how do you view them when you are prescribing uh, or we you're trying to help people? Yeah, great question. So I'll start with this. You know, I'm not trying to replace a medication list with a supplement list. Okay. That's always what I tell people, you know. that's If you have that kind of framework, then then I think you're, you're starting off on a, on a good foot. You know, really a lot of what the, what the supplements are, they are supplements. Supplements mm -hmm. to the therapeutic process, which always has its foundation in those five things that we talked about, mm -hmm. the sleep, exercise, nutrition, all that stuff. If people are not, if we're not able to make changes, or if they have a particular issue that isn't amendable to those those five different mm -hmm. interventions, that then we'd you, you'd use a supplement, a very targeted supplement that's again mm -hmm. evidence based, yeah. isn't just you know oh, I heard this thing or read this I thing read a on a blog. blog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think what what's happened is you know there there are certain practitioners, and this is this is universal in all medicine, right? Mm -hmm. That just kind of you know, they kind of get derailed a little bit and they start prescribing things that aren't necessarily, you know, don't necessarily make sense or have a lot of mm -hmm. evidence. 
Um, and then people end up getting a lot of supplements um, as a result of that. But there is, I, I do want to bring this up though. You know, when, we, when I say evidence-based, you know, the Institute for Fun, we went to a couple conferences for the Institute for Functional Medicine mm-hmm. and they provided this really cool diagram that I always think about. And they kind of describe evidence-based medicine as using three different things. The scientific literature, the, the, the practitioner's clinical experience, and patient preference. Mm. And that's evidence-based. Yeah. You know, because it includes all those different things, you know. It includes what the patient actually wants to do, which is probably the single most important thing. And then what you've seen happen, what's worked, and then um, what the literature supports. Mm. And if you've gone to any of the... the uh, the uh, CrossFit Health conferences and learned about the problems with research nowadays. <laughs> you might so be happy. You might be happy that we have those two other things to, yeah. to rely on. But um, we kind of got derailed there. But that's you know yeah. that's that's how a we part of supplements. Yeah. Yeah, and you think about. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a lot of this is all self experimentation. It's that like end of one experiment mm. when you're talking about nutrition or you're talking about certain supplements, it's like you want to change one thing at a time and see, is it actually making a difference in the person in a positive way? And if it is, then great. Mm-hmm. If not, then it's probably not worth it. Yeah. And I think the the PTs that are that are watching or listening to this uh, could, could benefit from that right there in terms of changing one mm-hmm. element of our programs. Because mm-hmm. a lot of times we'll throw 18 different types of activities or exercises mm-hmm. Uh, and but only have one functional measure, mm-hmm. you know, like a, a, a timed up and go, for example, to mm-hmm. be like, is this actually working or not? Mm-hmm. Uh, but you don't know what's working. Cause right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so yeah. tweaking as few variables as possible. Well, that's good stuff. Um, so so Jason also, he asked, uh, what's your all's per- perspective of genetic testing? Do you leverage it at all? Mm-hmm. Does that help you inform your interventions? I think we're we're at a place now where we have the technology to to sequence people's genomes for cheap, at least, okay. you know, certain stretches of, of, of our genes. Um, but we don't necessarily have all the data to know what they mean. Mm-hmm. So in some situations, some very particular, you know, genetic mutations have clinical significance. We know the impact on the disease process or, or kind of how it affects treatment. Mm-hmm. But a lot of these things, SNPs, for example, SNP, okay. are small, single um, kind of letter changes in the DNA. But that can potentially have an impact on a person's physiology. Mm -hmm. But there's so many different variations of that, and we're able to pick up all these different variations. We don't necessarily know what we we don't know what they mean. Mm -hmm. But what happens is a lot of people have access to that information. They see these SNPs, they see these you know differences in their genetic code, and they get concerned. They're like, Mm -hmm. "Oh, what does this mean? What does that mean?" And at this point, the data only allows us to make associations, and oftentimes it doesn't even let us know what we can do about Mm -hmm. it. So although genetic testing is available. And in certain situations, it's quite helpful. I don't think we're at a stage now or, or quite yet where we can say, you know, everyone should get their genome sequenced so that it's kind of like a fifth vital sign or so. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I mean, I think there are some interesting things now. It's still just so early, but interesting things as far as nutrition. And there's this whole field of nutrigenomics and trying mm-hmm. to use your genome to figure out, like, what is the optimal nutritional prescription for you. And so I think you know, people can geek out on that a lot. And there is, you know, especially for certain um, people, there are things that you may want to change. But at the end of the day, I think it's that real life experiment Mm -hmm. because our Mm -hmm. genes tell us the code, but it's the inputs that we put in. It's the environment, the nutrition, all the things that we're doing that affects the expression of those genes. Mm -hmm. And so um, like experimenting and finding out what works best for you, I think is still like the gold standard. Yeah. And starting with those five things that we talked about, right? Yeah. Once you've we've, you've dialed, once you're getting nine hours of sleep and you know you're yeah. eating well, then maybe it makes sense to dig a little bit deeper, right? Um, with with more testing, including genetic. People testing. don't want to do that though. They want. The- right. I, <laughs> I want to quick fix. Yeah, yeah, I love the analogy of like if you have a big jar, first you have to put big rocks in, mm, right? Yeah. So those are like the sleep and the nutrition and the stress and all of that stuff. Once those are in, then you can start putting in the smaller pebbles. So that might be like some extra lab testing. Um, it might be like little details like timing of food intake and that sort of thing. And then after that, you can fill in the sand. And that's when you start looking at like supplements or maybe genetic testing or maybe more advanced mm-hmm. testing. But there's still a few people who already have all the rocks in place and all the pebbles in place. Most of the time people come in and 
you know, they're still eating like McDonald's or Mm -hmm. they're eating ice cream three times a week and not sleeping because they're so stressed out and they want to do all these extra things. Yeah. And it's like, let's work on the biggest impact stuff first. Yeah. And so that resonates with me as well and a lot of people watching and listening because they're... And you, I mean, you all see this all the time too. Like, there's this new fad or some sexy intervention. It's mm-hmm. brand new, cutting edge. Like, mm-hmm. you know, probably, you know, DNA testing and all that fun stuff. Um, but like in our world, like a lot of people just need to get stronger. You know, like they mm-hmm. need that type of stressor yeah. before we start to do all these crazy right. exercises, staying yeah. on these crazy surfaces and doing all these different things. Like, yeah. it, what are the big rocks for? Each, and yeah. it's going to be different for each patient, but there are some big rocks that are consistent to, mm-hmm. to human beings. So I like that. Right. So, and it's not always fun, right? Like, no. <laughs> it's hard work. It's consistency. It's like the daily grind of like making your food and doing the squats or the whatever oh, exercises you saw that are so boring. I hate like, <laughs> whatever it is, it's not always going to be so exciting, but that's the yeah. stuff that really makes a yeah. difference. Yeah, I think uh, the remember it was like the second or third workout that we went to at our at the CrossFit box. Or it was later than that. It was like a few weeks in. And, you know, we, we were all talking after the, the, the Metcon at the end and, you know, everyone's like, oh, that was terrible. And, and I, I was like, man, that, that hurt. Like that, not like painful way, but like, man, that was very challenging. And this guy, he was, what he's probably like mid forties or something like that. Mm-hmm. He's just a badass in every sense of the word, but he just looks at me and goes, it doesn't get easier. You just get better. <laughs> and he just walks off. <laughs> like that is like resonate with me. It just it won't get easier. Like yeah. get that out of your head. Like all this stuff doesn't get easier, yeah. but you get better. You get more fit on mm-hmm. that continuum that that you mentioned. And yeah, I I so freaking true. love that. <laughs> yeah. So all right. Well, I want to be respectful of your all's time. Um, it's been a long weekend. So well, one last question. So you're talking to mostly PTs or maybe some OTs and speech therapists and whatnot in here, uh, but mainly PTs, PTAs. Uh, if they're, when you write that script, PT of Alan Treat, what is one thing that you want that, that PT to do or, or one characteristic that you want them to have? So we'll just go, we'll go, you'll start with you and then we'll end with Danny. Or we I, don't have to start I would with you say, like, I feel like, like I had like a win on a shift if I like refer somebody to PT. Like, <laughs> like, I thought I was getting Percocet. <laughs> um, yeah. oh, um, it's close to home, you know. It's like, <laughs> I, w- I would just say this is really simple and basic, but just talk to the doc, communicate with the doc. Mm. Um, I would love to get a phone call. Um, you would? Yeah. You don't want a fax of 25 pages. Well, he's no. also pages. the guy with 600 pages. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know no, if every no. person would say and, that. And let me, tell you, let me tell you why. For that reason. Like, yeah. 15 forms for me to look through and, like, remember what the acronyms mean. It's, it's a big... I'm like, dude. I mean, like... <laughs> they're getting better, they're not getting better. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, if, if in a perfect world, I would love, like... And maybe this is in there. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But, um, like, a little blurb. This is, like, you know patient is doing well, this is what you as the medical provider can keep an eye out for, just so there's some sense of communication so that mm-hmm. we're on the same page. Um, I mean, I just like talking to people, you know, on the phone. I think that's really helpful because <laughs> then you can kind of have You're a little so bit of... not a millennial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you just shoot me a text? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just text just me text before it. you call and then I may no, answer. But, <laughs> what I mean is, you know, some, some sense of dialogue. Yeah. yeah. Where we trained, at, you know, at the Cleveland Clinic, we had um, a really nice staff messaging system. And I would mm. love, what, I'd love it when I get messages from the PT and they're like, oh, you know, Mrs. Smith is doing great. Right yeah. now we're on this. Um, this is what the plan is for the next two weeks. Boom. It's like three sentences. And now mm. I know what's going on. I can talk to Mrs. Smith when I see her next week and ask her how, if she's doing the exercises, how those are going. Yeah. So that kind of thing. Just communicating back and forth. And then, of mm-hmm. course, doing functional movements. Yeah. I mean, that's just yeah, no-brainer. Which is, is not common. So. Yeah, which is <laughs> we're, crazy. We're, we're working on that on, on our end. Um, but, but the communication piece, that as, as a home health clinician, which home health, which you all see this, but in our world, the stereotype of that is it, a lot of people don't want to do that. A, because it's with older adults. You're going into who knows what type of home, uh, which can be kind of fun. Uh, but the documentation, <laughs> I mean, our documentation is just absurd. Yeah. And so uh, monthly assessments, every 60 days we do this recertification, 
And what you get faxed, it, I don't even want to see the end product. I mean, I can't even imagine how long it is. And there is that little blurb that you Somewhere want to there. see, but it's towards the end. And it's it's written in a way that's not for you, but for Medicare A yeah. or yeah. whatever uh, third-party payer <clears throat> to, to have a speak in this way that you may not necessarily understand. Now, granted, I know a lot of the people in management, they're going to watch, it's like, well, Dustin, you can do the blah, 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 blah. You know, like yeah. documentation can be helpful. Yeah. And yeah. I, I understand that. And we could all be better documentation. But when you've got a full-time therapist, a full-time case, so then you are expecting them to write in a, in a certain manner to please all parties involved, like that, not to say it can't be done, but it's hard for a lot of people. Uh, so y'all can complain about that later on <laughs> for the, the, the PT crowd. Um, so yeah, communication. So what would be what would be yours? So I would just say, I'll echo on the functional movies, but I would say like you are probably going to have a lot more contact with the patient. Like so over that short period of time, maybe seeing them weekly or maybe even more frequently than that. If you're, I guess, in more of an outpatient, I don't know. It depends on the setting. Yeah, yeah, but definitely. you're definitely going to have more contact and you're going to be with them for a long period of time while they're doing these exercises. So I think like one of the biggest things for me is that everyone in healthcare is working with this same goal in mind of trying to help people get healthier. Mm -hmm. And so, so often there's time where one, by us setting an example first of, you know, showing health mm -hmm. and not eating like drinking soda while we're in front of patients and like all that yeah. sort of stuff. But Two, it's like use that time to talk with the patient about what else they could do to help be healthier. Mm. Um, teaching them exercises that they can continue to do, whether it's for that specific problem or something like, hey, you know, what do you normally do for exercise? What could you start doing after you graduate from PT? So mm. that it's not like it's just you fix one problem and then it ends there and then they stop moving. Yeah. And I'm sure that's what you guys are always trying yeah. to do, <laughs> trying to focus on, but like I think if everyone on the healthcare team is constantly reinforcing right. that, it can mm -hmm. be a lot more powerful. Right. Just in one conversation, it may seem like you're getting nowhere, but if they're hearing it from multiple places, eventually it might help. Right. I think that brings up a, a great point of us setting each other up for success. You know, mm -hmm. like even say I do initial evaluation, I think speech is going to be helpful. It, it has a big mm -hmm. impact mm -hmm. on potentially the outcomes of speech therapy based on, you know, how I set them up. Like, like oh, yeah, Julie's going to come in. You know, she may get you to remember some things, whatever. It's cool. You need to squat more. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or versus like, Julie's going to come in. She's awesome. She's going to help you be sharper. And, uh, you know, these tasks will become easier. Like, she's great. She's awesome. Everyone loves her. Like, that that impacts, you yeah, know, yeah. The, the outcomes. And we can all do that with yes. the people that we... Yeah. The power of suggestion is... So <laughs> we yeah. have a faculty member who teaches us all about that. And it really, mm -hmm. it is. The more you can try to spin it positive and say, I think you're going to do so mm. great with this. I think you're going to feel a lot yeah. better. I think, you know, the patient that, that works. Yeah. Like that, that has a lot of. Impact. Yeah. The whole therapeutic process in general mm -hmm. has, is healing in general. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's beautiful. All right, ER doc. <laughs> so, yeah, think about think the, like, the three PT I, scripts I that you've written. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I will say I, having a PT, <clears throat> Father, husband, and sister-in-law. I refer to PT a lot yeah. more than most of my colleagues. Um, <laughs> but I would say, kind of echo a little bit on what Julie said of, um, kind of on your end. Like we can, I can tell them like, hey, this is what's going on, or what I think is going on. Once you see PT, come back for X, Y, or Z. You know, if these red flags kind of turn up. But I think reiterating that from like the end of your therapy, you know, sessions as well of like. Hey, if, if this starts, here's how you can head it mm -hmm. off. Or mm -hmm. if this comes back, come back and see us. Yeah. Or if these things happen, go to the ER. Mm -hmm. um, I think re reiterating some of those things and along the lines of communication, making sure you're communicating for the right person. Because I think some of the people I've, I remember I referred a girl to PT and I'm at three different locations and my shifts are all over the place. And I think mm -hmm. two months later, got some paperwork of mm -hmm. like signing off for more PT sessions for this girl who actually went that I was pumped about, but I was like, I'm not going to sign this. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not following her. You know? yeah. um, so trying to communicate with the PT or with their primary, mm -hmm. um, yeah. if they have one. They have one. Yeah. Um, and I would say lastly, don't judge me for getting that imaging because it's, I get paid to roll out worst case scenario. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. Yeah, that, and that's a trend in our world in terms of seeing, you know, how imaging in some cases can can be harmful in some yeah. cases, you know, mm -hmm. or it may not be 
it may not impact the actual interventions. But yeah, like you, you're paid to worry. You're paid to yeah. think worst case scenarios. <laughs> yeah. Like that's your job, and you have to rule things out. Well, good stuff. Um, all right, I I'm very thankful for y'all sticking around and talking to me. There there will there's a lot of things I'll probably mention this. I'll record a little a little bit later. But I just want the the PT crowd to think about how they think about their patients and the emphasis on communication, but the emphasis on fitness, on lifestyle mm-hmm. uh, decisions that we can all make. The first of us actually uh, acting on them and, and displaying them ourselves. Um, but then, you know, this is a way forward. This is how we're going to make a big impact in a huge problem that we have. It's not by, you know, the, the way of the past, but by being fitness forward um, mm-hmm. or facing fitness instead of, you know, the pill or the knife or, mm-hmm. you know, ultrasound mm-hmm. or east end, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. good stuff. Thank awesome. you. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah. I appreciate it. Super fun. All right. Yeah. Lucy, Thanks good so job. Much. Good, good job. Thanks for falling asleep at the very end. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it, folks. Julie Fouché, Daniel Cuyo, Megan Jones, Lucy Lenore. Awesome conversation. I uh, really enjoyed that, and I hope you all gained a lot of insight into the, the heads of a uh, physician, of a practicing physician, and also thinking about how uh, you can be more fitness-facing, uh, how we can implement fitness into our treatment sessions, into our plans of care, uh, and to really see the importance of that and to see the shift towards uh, really looking at that whole person and not just addressing their low back pain or their shoulder pain or some of these specific deficits, but having a broader view of what is really uh, kind of the triage list of these individuals, the big rocks, like like Julie said, what do these people need for health and not just for their back to feel better? Uh, that's something I'm thinking about all the time now, especially as I'm talking to more and more people that are incorporating these principles uh, so I just really appreciate their perspective. Um, to contact or to follow along at their journeys on on social media, uh, I'm gonna there will be links in the show notes for this. It can be found at senioriaproject.com, uh, but juliefouche.com. So J U L I E F O U C H E R dot com is where you can find links to all of Julie's social media accounts, uh, the online training that she does. Um, but also the Pursuing Health podcast. So juliefouche.com, go there, check it out. Awesome site, lots of helpful information. Um, SteadyMD.com is where you can find Danny. Uh, That's where you can see kind of what he's up to and also how you could work with him if you would like. He's also on uh, active on Instagram at D-A-N-I-U-R-C-U-Y-O-M-D. So Danny or Kuyo MD. Uh, Obviously the links are gonna be in the show notes. Uh, my wife does not want you to follow her <laughs> and Lucy Lenore does not have an online presence yet. So yeah, appreciate it. If y'all have any questions, hit me up. I uh, really enjoy this conversation. Hope to bring more of these types of conversations to y'all. Have a good one.